Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Watson Library. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm the Dean of Libraries, and we're delighted to have you here with us today. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that the University of Kansas occupies land that has long been cared for by several tribal nations. Specifically, we reflect on the painful history of genocide and forced removal, while also committing ourselves to support the sovereignty of Native American people and communities. As a state institution, we ask you to take time to understand and acknowledge the history that has brought our institution to occupy space on indigenous land and to understand our institution's place within that history. Thank you again for being here. This is an exciting occasion for a number of reasons. For one, sitting in a circle is the first Paracon Gallery exhibit opening in two years. Now, why is that again? <laughs> Second, we are gathered in the newly renovated Paracon Gathering Gallery. You'll see several changes, including the absence of our glass cases that you may have been familiar with. And that's because Sitting in a Circle is our first digital experience exhibit in Watson Library. We're hoping you enjoy viewing and participating in that experience, both here and online. It's been long in the making, and we're very proud to share it with you this evening. It took a lot of special colleagues to pull our event together tonight and to make this possible. So I'd like to thank Sarah Goodwin Field, who's been smiling at me over there, and Samantha Bishop Simmons for their efforts to curate this first ever digital exhibit. Samantha will also moderate our panel discussion in just a moment. And our fantastic team from the Office of Communications and Advancement for their event management and promotional work. The Sitting in a Circle exhibit is inspired by the 2021-22 KU Common Book, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Klimmerer. KU Libraries are proud to be a partner in our university's Common Book program to promote engagement across campus. We're excited for you all to learn more about this important program and book today. So I'm delighted to introduce Jill Becker, who has coordinated the library's participation in the Common Books program, Common Book program, who will tell you a little bit more about it. And kind of we'll kind of figure out the best route. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Up there. Choosing the piano route. And there is this thing designed to trip us. So all right. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon for today's event. Uh, so as Kevin shared, the Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer is the 2021-2022 Katie Common book. And we are nearing the end of formal programming surrounding this book as we near the end of the academic year. And today we're gonna to hear from students and faculty who engaged with this book and its themes in their courses. One of the program goals for the KU Common Book is to encourage intellectual engagement through reading and discussion. This often occurs in classrooms, but also in spaces like today's program and other events that have been, on, been ongoing throughout the year. So as this academic year wraps up, so will our engagement with Braiding Sweetgrass. Uh, there's still lots of copies available, so if anybody here today has not read it yet, it is wonderful. There are several scattered about over in the exhibit space, and you're welcome to take one with you. But we are already looking forward to next year's KU Common Book for the 2022-2023 academic year, which is called Disability Visibility, First Person Stories for the 21st Century, edited by Alice Wong. So please look for programming and events on the KU Common Book website as it gets closer to the start of the fall semester so that you can participate in this ongoing programming. Uh, currently, the steering committee for the Common Book programming is planning opportunities for faculty and instructors to consider how they might integrate the Common Book into their fall courses. And so hopefully today's program will give you some ideas of how instructors and faculty and students have used the book in the classroom, will spark ideas for how you might continue to integrate the book into courses uh, each year. There will be more opportunities 
in the month of April, uh, beginning with a modified version of the Red Hot Research Program that's held at the Commons. Uh, we are calling this Red Hot Reading, and it will kick off on April 15th at 4 p.m. And that will kick off a series of events for faculty and instructors to start thinking about uh, next year's Common Book Program. So now I would like to introduce Samantha Bishop Simmons, who will be moderating today's program. She is currently the Research and Learning Programs Coordinator for Peeney Libraries, and she also uh, serves on this exhibits committee. So welcome, Samantha. Thank you, Jill, and welcome to everybody who is here. If you have not had a chance to take a look at the amazing work that the folks sitting up here did over last semester, I encourage you to um, take a look at that. And after hearing what they are going to be sharing with us today, I'm sure that you will jump right into wanting to know more about it. So we featured in the gallery this semester three different classes that use braiding sweetgrass in radically different but equally important ways. And I'd like to introduce those folks to today. Um, so the first class that is featured in our gallery is Natural Dyes for Textiles. And that was a course that was offered by Mary Ann Jordan, professor in the textiles department, uh, or program in the Department of Visual Art. Her research interests include quilting, fabric construction, sewing, fiber art, and natural dyeing, among other things. And she's here today with Kirsten Taylor, who is also a student in visual art. Next course that we are going to talk about is an architecture class called Sustainability Site in Context. And that was taught by Shannon Kreese, professor of architecture in the School of Architecture and Design, who is also a licensed architect. Her research interests include sustainable development, public interest design, and healthy communities practice. And she brought quite a few of her students with her. Uh, one thing we hate to see is really engaged students. So. <laughs> uh, and so those students who will be talking today is are, include Kevin Bainter, Scarlett Weeded, Weeded? Yeah. Megan Booth, <laughs> Jay Clements, and Mallory McGraw. And finally, we will be talking a little bit about the course Influence of Music on Behavior, which was taught by Deanna Hansen Abermite, Associate Professor of Music Therapy in the School of Music, who is also a board certified music therapist. Her clinical and research focus is with infants in medical and community based settings. And she's here today with Olivia Jowles, music therapy student. So let's go ahead and get started. If you guys wouldn't mind, and you can go in any order that you like, if you could just give a brief overview to our audience today about what the class that you taught was about and what pro final project that the students will be here to talk about today. Okay, so um, I'm Marion Jordan um, in visual art, and our class was focusing on the use of plants for dyes. Um, so we uh, grew plants, harvested plants, and then um, used them as a dye source for textiles. Um, the initial part of the course was really spent on um, learning how to do that and the processes involved in preparing fabrics and fibers for the, for the dye process. And then in the end, uh, we did a lot of notebooks, and you'll see um, Kristen's work actually, um, a lot of her notebook um, uh, pages are, are in the uh, exhibition. Um, so it was a lot of testing and experimenting. And then, and then the final project was to take those, um, those uh, projects one step further to make an art piece or to uh, experiment with, um, with another, another dye process. So uh, most of the students chose to make some kind of art piece or a garment or a wall hanging or something like that. So that was the final project. Um, our class was Influence of Music on Behavior, which is a junior level music therapy core course. And this course is centered on an introduction to neuroscience and music. So with students, um, we explore the different brain structures and neural processes related to music and behaviors primarily focusing on attention and emotion. Um, 
in our final project, we've been looking at how um, basic science can inform therapeutic functions of music related to treatment goals for clients that we are working with. Um, and so we kind of wove all those things in um, to our class and ended up with um, a, kind of a, a scholarly, uh, we call it the therapeutic functions of music plan that then also informed a composition, a music composition that the students um, wrote in relationship to that goal specific thing. <coughs> And I just want to remind folks to press the button until it's green. Our mic is being a little naughty right now. This my word? Okay. <laughs> so I'm Shannon Chris, and uh, you know, professor in architecture, as said, and um, we, my class is a sophomore level design studio course where students learn how to process sustainability site and context into their work. And um, we started off uh, this semester on a warm January day, which was remarkable that we found one, um, and walked the prairie up at Rockefeller Center and uh, really came to, and you know, it's, it's brown and, you know, it's not the prairie that you see living, but there's still so much to learn there. And it was really uh, a great day, just as you might hear, some students had not experienced the prairie before, so it was kind of eye awakening moment. Um, the project built around Rainy Sweetgrass, the narratives in that, and um, we kind of brought back little pieces of the prairie and assembled them in the class. Students did sketches in response to some of the chapters. And it really, I think, um, led a kind of conversation and another way to think about what does it mean to build, to build in a built environment and to, um, to honor that work. Um, so their first project uh, was to design a small pavilion in that prairie landscape. And um, it was interesting as the semester uh, moved on, some of the discoveries that they made, and you can see in the slides um, some of the work that they produced. A small project, but a quick one to kind of build around the, the stories from Bridge, Bridge and Sweetgrass. And now we're working in Kansas City, Kansas, um, at the Cobb Point Park which is the, uh, at the moment where the Cobb meets the Missouri Rivers. Um, it's one of the most significant sites in Kansas City, but probably maybe one of the most forgotten spaces um, in terms of people access to it and people knowing it. And so for me, this has been interesting just to see how that early work and appreciation of the text and the experience of the first project is now starting to influence the way we think about uh, programming this project. It's going to be a community center, hypothetical project, although associated with the real projects that are going on in Kansas City um, that uh, really focuses, and they have to kind of come up with a thesis or a kind of idea about what that community center would be. And I'm hoping we'll talk about that a little bit today. I think the book and those experiences have influenced that a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Now I'd like for you to take a minute and talk a little bit about how braiding sweetgrass impacted either how you designed your class assignment, if you're the instructor, or how that influenced the approach that you took to your student project, if you were the student who completed it. Um, yeah, so I think I had actually um, been able to read braiding sweetgrass before um, it was even a common book. But I, um, it definitely was something that I thought about a lot during the class, and specifically um, the honorable harvest, because my final project um, was based on harvesting and foraging um, all native plants for for my dye project. So um, there are like dye that you can or dye stuffs that you can buy from, um, from different companies. And so you can be buying, you know, something that might be grown somewhere else in the world and it's, it's still a natural dye coming from the plants. But I really wanted to focus on plants that I could also interact with. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about the honorable harvest as I was doing this and, and just how really getting to know and making space to get to know the plants that are in your life on a daily basis and you know what are their conditions and what are their needs and what are their desires um, and then all of the other animals that are involved too so for instance when i was collecting sumac which is um, a native plant that can be used for dyes um, i was thinking about how 
native birds depend on sumac berries, especially in the winter when it's really hard um, and there's not much food to find. The berries are still there. They, they, and you'll probably see them. They kind of stay um, on the trees even after all the leaves are gone. And so thinking of the honorable harvest, not only because I want the sumac trees to continue to be around, but also the birds need them too. So um, that was one of the ways that Robin Wall from Westwood really sprung to mind for me. So for our current project, that first project um, that Shannon was talking about, um, breeding sweetgrass really changed the way I thought about mass site placement. Um, so in the book, we learn about how it's important for humans to interact with site. Um, humans have their own place in nature, um, as noted by when humans didn't um, basically you know, pick up the sweetgrass, like it wasn't healthy. Um, like the fields where humans didn't interact with it. And so for my site, I really wanted to bring humans into the site. So I designed a distinct path following the contours of the site, and I placed my pavilion in the middle of the prairie, so I really wanted to establish a connection between humans and the site. Um, I think like bringing sweet grass is really eye-opening in some sort of way. I think we all have this idea that nature is best when it's left alone. And just like Kevin said, reading that chapter where the author says, like, no, nature is supposed to be, like, everything that we do is supposed to be along with nature. So coming into my site, I really wanted to respect the site. I wanted it to just maintain the beauty of it. And I wanted my structure to add to that beauty. I didn't want it to be like, the main event, and I didn't want it to be the spot where people are going to go to. I wanted the people to enjoy the prairie, but still be able to come to this structure that I'm making, and also have that structure help the prairie in some way. I didn't want the structure to avoid like the water not being able to come all the way down the hill because my structure is there. So kind of just like thinking about the small details of how am I going to put something there but still allow everything that's already happening in the prairie naturally to still occur, even if it's um, with my structure there. Um, going along with what Scarlett said, um, I had the same idea. I mean, we wanted our designs to take part in the land rather than take from it, which was a common theme in bringing sweetgrass. So um, the idea of a mutually beneficial relationship between the land and the humans was um, something that we strongly considered in our project. And, you know, going from this project to the next one, I think for myself and for me, I'm still keeping this idea of the land, but giving and taking from the land um, down at Collin Point. Uh, like, my thesis is the heritage trail secret for the indigenous people. And so I am continuing to draw from this book and um, from this gallery and like initiating a value garden around. You know, learning about those processes and how can we use nature as it was before. Yeah, um, I think just from the first project and um, learning about that, having that appreciation for nature and plants um, was really inspiring for our next project. Um, so, my thesis for the next project is um, the Heritage Trail Center for the Restoration of Native Plants in Kansas City. And um, the way that I'm approaching that is by first creating an appreciation for the native plants, bringing that back in. And um, I'm doing that by creating spaces that people are able to paint um, the flowers and really see that natural beauty and be able to restore it back into the city. So it's really interesting to be able to um, foster that appreciation and apply it to what we're doing. Just have to say, I'm very proud of my students, and it was such a joy for them to take initiative and start to see the potential in a place that is mostly asphalt and um, neglected, and perhaps even a little bit urban risky. 
right? A place that's um, off the beaten path. And so it's really nice to see this kind of hope and possibility. And I have to say for architecture students to think about landscape design, um, we, you know, this is something we, we don't push enough and kind of explore enough. So this book has been really enabling for me as a professor to, to kind of make these connections um, through literature, not, not necessarily from technique or practice. To, before we let Olivia talk a little bit about her experiences with the book, um, using this book in a neuroscience and music class isn't an obvious choice, except that when I read it over the summer, I probably dog-eared more pages and made more notes than in any other text or novel I've ever read or anything, um, because I was seeing the relationship um, to the, the, the stories and the points in this book to being a really good therapist and the relationship of this idea of reciprocity and what's happening with our environment and our brains and our experiences and our behaviors. And then coming back to campus after being away for a year and a half and kind of getting us connected with the land and ourselves um, was a way to kind of help them start to recognize that their role in the therapeutic process was really important. So I just kind of wanted to give a little perspective because we did lots of different activities with the book. Yeah, we did do a lot of different activities. And I think one of them that would probably be like the most obvious comparison to Brain and Seagrass was we have a little um, sort of outdoor space on Stanley Street there courtyard, there we go, that's the name, um, in the School of Music, and so we, you know, broke off into groups, and we were trying to um, find ways to bring, like, more community and life into the courtyard, um, so some people, like, decorate rocks and put them out so they would be more visually appealing, other people planted more native plants in there, um, but another way that we had integrated it was in our idea, um, like Dr. Hanson Everlet was saying, of being a therapist and not only coming from the perspective of like trying to help people by being like an expert and professional, but also just being a human. Um, a lot of the ideas that I pulled from the book were the ideas of reciprocity and sort of getting back what you um, put into relationships and the aspect of giving to others being the thing that fuels you and also the integration of her knowledge like from her indigenous elders, um, combining that with the very hard science of biology um, and integrating those two things to have a more holistic understanding of things. So I definitely took that um, because music therapy is an evidence-based practice, so we highly value the idea of like randomized control trials and very academia-based things where sometimes I think some of the students lose the sight of the fact that like it's the human connection and the connection with music that makes music so beneficial. Um, and so I've taken it with me that like, Yes, it's important to, you know, explain what you're doing based on the science, based on how music can impact the brain and how it can change different structures and change hormones and things. But it's also important from the spiritual aspect and that it's okay and not only okay, but also beneficial to take in that more spiritual, humanistic aspect of making a relationship with someone when they're going into practice. Thank you, those are wonderful. Do you have more? Um, I just have one yes, uh, quick comment, I think. Um, um, I think, no, pretty much the chair. Um, I feel like everyone up here has referred to one of my favorite chapters, which was um, learning from the grass, uh, or maybe it's learning from the teaching grass, or, the, grass. Um, the teaching of the grass. Um, and um, and also, I learned a lot about traditional ecological knowledge and combining. You know, I mean, I think you've talked about some of the poetics of 
of um, of these um, relationships, um, which I think is important, um, and also the idea. Uh, I think in, in creative fields that we use a very similar kind of approach to ideas as a scientific, you know, where you have an idea and you form a method and then you have the results and then, you know, you kind of do a review or a critique. Um, and so um, that that particular chapter was um, especially, um, uh, it just, it sort of touched a lot of the things that we deal with in, in visual art. Um, and I also, just in terms of learning, I'm kind of new to the to um, to working with plants and things like that. Um, and so I've been planting some uh, dyed plants, and every time I uh, I would grow them and cut them off, and I would just say, "I'm sorry." <laughs> I was like, "I cut this off," and I was like, and so I finally decided, especially with that chapter where um, you know they're talking about basket makers understanding the harvesting of sweetgrass bene being beneficial to the to the plant itself. Um, so I was able to change my apology to a thank you. <laughs> so, and that made me feel a lot better about what I was doing too. So um, I think it really touches a lot of different aspects of our, of our creative practice. Professor Jordan brings up a wonderful point and something that comes up often in the work which is this relationship between indigenous knowledge and <coughs> academic knowledge and how it was frequently misunderstood in academia and sometimes outright disparaged. When you were working with this book throughout your assignments and through the semester, was there anything at any point that you found surprising or challenging? I think the whole notion of bringing in a book like Brady Sweetgrass to influence the music on behavior was um, a little surprising to the students. It was also surprising to me, but boy, just it resonated with me so much and made me recognize it's being more than doing. Um, but I think that was the biggest surprise. Like, how is this book going to be meaningful to us? We're supposed to be talking about the brain and music. Um, so I don't know, Olivia, maybe you could kind of touch on some surprises. Um, I think one of the biggest surprises for me, kind of going off of that, was, um, I guess going back to what I had said, that, you know, Kimmer was, um, not only able to combine, like, what she had learned, like, from her childhood and from other indigenous people with her, like, science background, but was able to, like, have a bigger understanding of the picture by integrating those two. Um, one of the chapters that stood out to me, I forget the name of the chapter, but it was about um, the goldenrod and castles, I believe, um, and how, like, from her own, like, personal childhood background, you know, she had seen these two flowers work together to, you know, not only create a more beautiful thing um, by, you know, having the purple and the yellow and like having them together, them growing together was more beautiful. And when she came to that, um, when she was at an interview for a college and she was asked why she wanted to be a biologist and she said, I want to know why the flowers are beautiful, the professor scoffed at her basically and was like, that's not science. Um, but then later she goes on to say that there is actually a scientific basis for that where having both the purple and the yellow together is more um, appealing to bees and so then they get more pollination together. Um, I think I was surprised that you know, basically she had come to the same conclusion and understanding of why those two plants grew together. Um, and her traditional knowledge was able to inform her scientific knowledge. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of times when we think about science and, you know, high echelon academia, we kind of like to separate it and kind of have it on this pedestal that is like 
you know, you can have fun with your art and music and humanities or whatever, but like science is special, but then it's not <laughs> because it's all about the same thing. Um, so I think that's what I took away most was the idea that, you know, you kind of need both the human aspect and the science aspect, like to really understand the whole concept and be able to fully apply it to your work. Um, I was surprised that I did not know about Sky Woman um, at the start of the book, right? I, I knew about Eve, but I had not really understood Sky Woman's story. Um, and one of these images you'll see over there, um, well, she did a beautiful painting of the Sky Woman, so you should definitely check that out. But um, there was another student um, that um, had two images. One was a hand of acceptance. So giving an uh, open, relaxed hand, and the other one was like this, and it, it, it felt like it was grabbing, and it was kind of, um, you know, there's these kind of two narratives, very different from each other, in terms of Sky Woman being an immigrant, and uh, really appreciation of the animals, and the, and the life and the seeds that were brought together, right, and that he was um, always in search for the afterlife, um, you know, Sky Woman was very present, and it felt like he was um, forced to move out of the Garden of Eden and, and move to other places. And so always felt like um, she had to kind of uh, find another place. So that was interesting to me that I, you know, at my age, had not really understood that story. Um, and I think my students felt the same way. They really hadn't thought about um, the narratives that we create for ourselves and how ingrained those stories are in the way that we think. Um, I think the gift of strawberries was one of my favorite, you know, students read this. Um, just the idea of um, gift and commodity exchanges. And um, as architects, we're always thinking about, you know, uh, how do we build it? What's, you know, what's its value? How do we, um, you know, what materials, uh, the, the kind of expression of it. Um, and the idea of gift was so sweet and so simple that I hadn't ever really kind of paused to think about um, gift exchange. And that if you start to think about it, and that's about relationships, right? We give gifts and we don't expect anything back, right? Like this idea of commodity um, is, I think, ingrained in our myths and our stories. Um, and I think it's such a beautiful thing. How can architecture actually be? a space of welcoming and gift and encouragement for diversity and you know, connection to nature. So um, that struck me. I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts that you want to say about that. Um, just going to share this. Head. I had never heard about this story. Like, I'm pretty sure we all heard about Adam and Eve and the Big Bang and everything and how everything was always kind of chaotic. Um, but then when you read the story, it's like so beautiful. The animals help the people and something beautiful comes out of it. And I just like reading that, it was kind of just peaceful, kind of nice knowing that there was somebody out there that grew up with this and that's how they envisioned the world that we live in. Um, so just knowing that just changed exactly like how I thought about it. Um, growing up in a country where I was surrounded by nature, Costa Rica, um, I always felt a really big connection to it, and I always wanted to make sure that anything that I did was either helping it or just, like, embracing it. Um, and reading those chapters where it's, like, the gift chapter, I don't know the name of it either, but um, it was so nice, and I kind of fin finally understood why I felt so deeply about nature. Because every time that I was there, I felt the gift of it just giving me like peace in some sort of way. Um, and I think this profession that we're in is so beautiful because in some sort of way, we're all designing um, and kind of giving this gift to the rest of the people to come and enjoy our building that we made without expecting anybody to say like, oh yeah, this architect made it. But I think that that's so beautiful. Architecture is always going to be there. Um, it's just going to be everywhere. And you're the one that decides like how it's going to affect the earth as well. If you design it, focusing on sustainability, 
how you can make sure that you're not using too much energy or you're using the sun or you're making sure that you're collecting the water for gardens or something like that. So I think just being an architect is so beautiful and special because essentially you're giving a gift to society um, and it might be there for a really long time in kind of the same way that nature is there for us. Um, so that's kind of just how I saw it. <laughs> Okay, final question then. So as you reflect on the book and the assignments and the experience of the last semester, how do you see some of the lessons that you've shared with us today having a continuing impact on your work? Well, I'm gonna read the book again and again and again. I think there's so much depth in there and um, I think it will continue to teach me and. I suppose, you know, will I use it again? Probably so, um, in some way. I also teach a, um, a lecture class to all sophomores on um, sustainable design principles, going from climate change to um, you know, urban design, site design, and passive building design systems. And so I think it's got me thinking, is there some way that I could bring this into a classroom of 100 students, right? And how can I do that in a meaningful way? So. I was just going to say, when I was reading it over the summer of 2021, mm -hmm. we can't really have any idea what year it is. Um, <laughs> I, we actually we were traveling in Philadelphia and walking through these beautiful historic parks and going to Independence Hall, and I saw a young woman reading the book in the mm -hmm. park. And I just made comment, oh, that's a really good book. And she looked at me and she's like, it's changing my life. Mm -hmm. And I, my response was yes. It's changing my life too. And I think just listening to everybody talk, one of the big takeaway points for me is that this book has given me the courage to have agency for being the kind of academic that is fit for me rather than the kind of academic that I'm supposed to be, which is, sounds weird after being in this as long as I have. But it just, Will I use it again? I, I would like to because I'd like to do better at weaving it into this course. But I also think that it has value in helping our students have agency for recognizing that who they are as people is really as important as what they know about the science of what they're doing. And so it was a good reminder to me to not just be about the science, but also recognize and have agency for that piece. So I think it had some sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, definitely will be reading it over and over again. It, that kind of carry it with me, actually. It's, it's on my nightstand or it's on a coffee table in my living room or it's in my bag or in my office. It's just, mm -hmm. it goes everywhere. <laughs> um, just to reiterate some of what was already said, um, in terms of um, hearing that we feel one thing, uh, I also read the book before it became the common book, so I reread it. Um, but one thing that um, that I discovered is that really you get a book in the first year, and you don't have to read it from start to finish. So the first time I read it, I read it from start to finish, and the second or third time I was just skipping around, and really you can just open any chapter and read it, and there are, so they can be shared, um, you know, as appropriate with a class or course assignment, so um, I do imagine that it will continue to be used and honestly I still you know as a person new to planting and plants and harvesting and um, and hearing about the prairie um, I'm learning something new every time I open the book so there's some other kind of um, perspective that 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 happens um, and for me the biggest challenge and just to step back to the last question for a quick um, comment um, is that since we are in the studio environment, um, it was harder. I, I'm not used, so used to directing um, uh, discussions about about a, a reading, and so that was a little more challenging for me because we're usually working directly with materials and making things and putting things together. So, um, so hopefully, and you know, like you mentioned, I'd like to be able to use it better. 
Um, I also think um, moving forward, I would like to incorporate the other county books more. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I've done that with a couple of the other past books, but I think there are ways that we can incorporate books that maybe are seemingly unrelated. So. I could just speak a little bit about my um, personal practice that um, creating Sweetgrass will, will definitely continue to be a part of that um, because my own work is, is focused on humans and our relationship with nature. Uh, this book is very applicable to that, as you might imagine. Um, and I also think it will continue to be important because because it is about a relationship, it's ongoing. Um, there isn't an end to our relationship with nature. We're, we're always in it, whether we're thinking about it or not. And, and this book helps us think about how we want to be in relationship and be intentional. So for, for myself, this will just always be, be a part of it. And I'm sure you know, as, as we move forward, our ideas will, will deepen um, and be enriched through our, our experiences, but um, I think this will continue to be a good text to return to. Any final thoughts anybody would like to share? Uh, I don't know uh, if all of you have seen the video that Kimmy produced that's on the um, website, the, the, common, the Common Thread site, that Kimmy mm -hmm. produced this a short video, it's about 20 minutes long, with an interview with Robin Walkheimer. I really encourage people to watch that, and that's posted, you know, we posted it for our class as well, but um, that's also a really nice, um, a nice video to, to watch, um, and I don't know if her, um, her talk for KU um, was recorded also, but there are lots of things online to, to see and to, to listen to from, from the author. Please thank our presenters for sharing their wonderful work with us today. Questions if anybody would like to ask. So, I teach field ecology course for environmental studies program. I have students going out to the Rockefeller Center quite often. And one of the themes that I try to impart is, to my students is the notion of the landscape change. That what you see around you there is not what was there 200 years ago or even 10,000 years ago. <coughs> And that throughout that whole time, humans have had a key role in shaping that landscape either deliberately or, in most cases, accidentally as a result of that. And I'm wondering if you were thinking of that as you were designing your project, that sense of the, the, the continuity of the place. And clearly, with Paw Point, you have a place that is traditionally very important and then you know, is now kind of accidentally uh, sort of neglected. And that sense of continuity that you're part of, your, your designs are part of a long strain, a long thread, like, of, of human interaction with the place. Yeah, um, I mean, when we had went up to the Lagoon once in the area, we walked along, and further back, we saw, like, I, I went further back and saw some leftover equipment from when we were spawning there. And that was um, something that was very, like, the evidence that it had been used to some of us before, very prominent was there. And as I walked through the prairie, um, I saw parts of wood that had been burned that was still left over. And walking along the, uh, the trail, there was the information guides about who had been here before, and I think that history that changing was definitely something that we kept in mind as I was um, designing just to be respectful of that history, but to know that it will continue to change, um, and that that's not necessarily a bad thing. So.
I think that's a beautiful thought. And um, yeah, there's, there's stories embedded in this in the landscape. And sometimes I think we want to remove traces of the good and the, or the bad stories, right? But I do think that um, those stories need to be told. In a community like Hot Point, where um, the local neighborhoods have been stressed by um, social injustices and redlining and all of these impacts that it has, I'm constantly thinking about the traces of history and impact of policies um, flooding and, and the billions of dollars that are now being invested in Kansas City to build up a levy, right? These are kind of decisions that we're making. Are they the right decisions? And how will that change the impact of this place? So our, our role is very small as, as architects, but um, I think trying to teach students and trying to practice in a way that pulls out those stories and recognizes them and the forgotten people that have inhabited this place through some of these students' uh, ways to approach it, I think is a really beautiful thing. The bee population and these native prairies and being attentive to the non-humans um, and how the human space start to kind of shape their projects and think about you know, what kinds of landscapes would be the healing landscapes for the site and let's hope for a stronger, more beautiful future and an enduring future. Yeah, the students had a lot to think about. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just do a little bit of a shout out, and I know there's not a question, but um, the, I'm trying to establish a, a, a more permanent dry garden on the Kane Field Station, which is um, just north of town, uh, past the airport. Um, and so I would encourage all of you even to visit that site. It's the um, medicinal garden. Um, and there are lots of native plants there. There's an observation garden that has some nice signage and labels about the plants. Um, and um, uh, and I would like to do some more community uh, engagement with that garden and also with the sort of natural dye process. Um, and not just for the natural dye process, but in part it sort of comes from a space of um, of wanting to encourage sustainability, textile industry is a huge polluter, um, and the way we um, buy clothes and wear clothes, and um, you know, uh, fast fashion is really impacting the environment and climate change. So, in some ways, this is like a small step that I can do, um, just uh, personally, to sort of encourage um, a recognition of some of those things, but. If you're interested in plants, I would really encourage you to just come out to the garden um, and um, come visit. It's it's open and you can come in any time. And um, many times I see Shannon there, and I will be there working too. So um, there are people to engage with in that kind of garden. Um, Kristen is also doing some work there, some prairie restoration work. You want to talk about this? Yeah. Can you repeat the location again? Uh, it's the KU Medicinal Garden. Okay. It's also, I think if you type in KU Student Farm, it comes up. Okay. Um, I can't remember the address. 1865. 1865. 1865. 1865 North 1600 Road. Thank you. Just north of the airport. Just a joke, everybody. It's part of the exhibition. Mm -hmm. It's going to be there tomorrow. It's very nice. So, <laughs> take a look at that. Yeah, so I, I'm actually doing a, a restoration project. Um, at the end of April, preparing for it by doing a burn of a small section that um, has has a lot of woody species that have kind of taken over. So um, once that's done, uh, there'll be a seed bottle making workshop that will happen on the 23rd of April, which is the day after Earth Day. Um, and it will be a project that actually draws heavily from our common book, um, Grading Sweetgrass, about reciprocity um, and also thinking about, um, like as an artist, I, I'm a creative worker and use my imagination. So how can I use my imagination to imagine a better future or a, a future um, that would be better for more than humans as well as humans? Um, so, so that project will be really focused on seeding your intentions for, for a better future while helping to also restore and seed this area native grasses and wildflowers. 
And I'll just throw in that Kelly Kushner and a group of graduate students planted some sweet grass up there. So if you would like to see what sweet grass looks like, there's a whole row of that. <laughs> We're outside the right native range of sweetgrass, so they're they're fairly sad little plants compared to where they've grown more up in, in the east of us. Um, David, did you have a question? Yeah, I was um, wondering in terms of music therapy, and I don't want to be too cliche about this, but Robin talks about being in nature all the time, and did did the book inspire you with um, considering? native soundscapes on the range and is, is, is that following? It's actually as we were sitting here I was thinking you know I think I've had people going out and recording sounds of like bird song you know so my area is with infants and so much of the understanding of how we process sounds comes from chick studies and and um and auditory development and things like that so we didn't. I was more, I think, literal with the integration in some ways. If we, we look in the garden, this, the courtyard at Murphy Hall is sadly kind of depressing and not cared for <laughs> at all. And we have this beautiful fountain and some way to kind of bring joy to that space and encourage people to be in community. Our music students never leave that building. They are there from 8 o'clock in the morning until eight or 10 o'clock at night, and there's, you have to walk across the street to the diverse center while they're open to get food, and um, so, so kind of bringing some, some beauty in that way, but I think there's actually more of a place of thinking about music doesn't stand separate from ecology and in the environment and people, it is embedded in there, and I think doing a better job of helping people understand that and recognize that our environment is so influenced by music and if we took that out of our environment in terms of na natural sounds, things that are existing already um, as part of nature, but if we took that away, it would be such a loss to everything. Um, and there are like lots of book studies that look at songbirds and their, their different pitches that they use in um, the same breed of bird are their songs are shifting in large cities like New York because of the, the noise impact um, compared to the, the same breed in the country. And so there are changes that are happening environmentally to the sounds that we are hearing and the way that we experience them. So it's a beautiful question. I think we could do a better job of understanding that. Yeah. I do want to mention that when you're talking about it, we did have um, one kind of brief assignment at the beginning of the year um, where she had asked us all to like take time out of our day to go for a walk. Um, you know, we could walk anywhere, but we were supposed to record and reflect, I think, on specifically what we heard. So like the different voices that we were taking. So I live um, near the Student Union on J. Hawk Boulevard, so I walked basically from there to Potter's Lake and back. Um, and I remember, like, because we were supposed to, like, be in the moment and, you know, think specifically about what we were hearing, I was surprised, probably shouldn't have been, um, but when I was consciously aware of it, I was surprised at, like, how much you know, construction and human-made sounds that started at the union, like cars and buses going, people talking, you know, machinery going off. And then as we were heading, as I headed towards Potter's Lake, like I started hearing the crickets and the bugs and, you know, birds chirping, and then the bell tower started playing. Um, so as I was walking around, you know, I heard like all of those different sounds of nature um, and then, unfortunately, I had to walk back to the human pollutant um, <laughs> sound. Um, but that was really impactful to me, even though it seemed like such a simple concept of just hearing what's around you without like trying to focus on something or trying to make sounds. Um, so I think you know that's potentially a good start 
to like integrating more the idea of like the natural sound around us and music. Um, so again, you know, we definitely took a lot of different approaches to integrating the book, but that will be a really interesting thing to go on. Well, I'm sorry to cut it short, but I think some of our students have to be somewhere in four minutes. Um, so I want to thank everybody again. If you'd like to talk more with these folks, stick around. Make sure you check out the gallery and the learning module and eat all of our food. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.